some of my thoughts about the progress over that time. And for today, for today, let's begin around 1950. Pretty much all of the post-1960 forestry stuff you see around here in the Okanagan and elsewhere in the BC interior was designed, planned, and executed by forestry students of mine. Understanding how we got here might help us understand why our forests look like they do today. And why the interior, you ask? Because this is where we are. The coastal forest energy is much different, and perhaps for another time. So we're going on a journey together, and we'll examine three sequences. Firstly, sustained yield and industrial growth. Secondly, integrated management. And finally, the term sustainable management. And if time permits, we may make a little journey in the future. Actually, we can't start immediately in 1950 on this timeline. We need to go back to 1865, because there was a Land Ordinance pa Act passed, and it granted the rights to harvest timber without the Crown selling the land. This Act preserved the forest land in our province for the public ownership, and since then, this policy remains sacrosanct to governments and to BC residents. So as we begin our journey, Let's make sure to remember that as far as forest land is concerned, the government, and it follows therefore you and me, are the landlords. 
and those who use the forest are the tenants. So over the years, the landlord, i.e. the government, has tried to manage forestry in the best interests of the public. And it has done this by evolving various types of tenure, which is just a fancy name for a different type of license for users, i.e. tenants. Okay, now we're ready to begin. It's 1950. The 10-inch disc of wood on the table there is the minimum size that was taken out of the woods. Everything smaller than that was left behind as of no value. Now a Royal Commission is convinced that the province's forests are about to be overcut and has recommended that a policy of sustained yield be implemented by the establishment of a regulated harvest rate that ensures our forests will continue in perpetuity. So the government of the day accepts all these recommendations and the result is a 25-year program of management, development, and expansion. The entire provincial forestry is inventoried over a five-year period. The Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia is created, and major efforts are made to eliminate the waste in logging and milling. Prior to this initiative, most logs were cut into lumber in small bills in the bush, and the lumber was trucked to town. In the Prince George region, for example, there were more than 600 bush mills in 1950. On average, after sawmilling, 50% of every log was left behind as waste. As we progress, we get down to the 8-inch log. Now, at least they're improving a little bit. Every log bigger than 8 inches on the small end will be taken. Everything else will be left behind. New tenures ensured some measures of supply continuity and requirements for reforestation through planting or natural regeneration. And a new social policy encouraged the centralization of all these bush mills. The transportation ministry began to develop more secondary roads. The education ministry would fund the salary of a teacher and the building of a one-room school if a mill owner could prove that there were 12 or more school-aged children living around the mill. Specialized logging trucks and logging equipment began to appear and sawmills became more efficient and larger. Excessive waste continued to be a concern and the government encouraged the development of pulp mills by allocating smaller and defective logs unsuitable for lumber to be pulped. The waste from sawmills was diverted to pulp mills and the consolidation of the mills continued as efficiency improved and the employees demanded facilities available to town. Utilization of smaller and smaller logs became universal and forestry was becoming the major economic driver in the province. Now we get down to the six inch disc. Everything smaller than six inches on the top is left behind. Hey, it's suddenly 1978 and a second Royal Commission has delivered its report. The government has to respond to the public's worries about the forestry concentration on wood and logging that may be detrimental to other forests' values. Some tenures are revised to favor smaller specialty sawmills and manufacturing plants. Requirements for planting are strengthened to include planting commercially valuable species tend the plantations until they are well enough established to grow without intervention, but the public wants more. This interval in our journey is only 10 years long. It's now 1988, and the concept of sustainable management is introduced following its presentation to the United Nations Brundtland Commission. Sustainable management emphasizes the interdependence of environmental integrity and economic development to meet the needs of current society and future generations. In the 1990s, the government got serious in involving the public in making decisions in forest land management. Public and industry representatives, i.e. stakeholders, participated in lengthy land use planning exercises, trying to figure out how public lands should be used, protected, set aside, for other uses, including forestry. Also, a, a commitment was made to involve, to respect, 
and to negotiate with First Nations and land use decisions. The working forest was reduced by 40%. What effect did this have on the allowable harvest and the implementation of this sustainable management? Now there's the forage disc. You can see we're down to 40% of the forest land base, 55 million hectares down to 22. That's currently where we're practicing forestry today. But what was the result of that? Well, I need, if I may, some volunteers. Can I have six people who are willing to stand up here and pretend to be a tree? One. Okay, can you stand up here, please? You're number zero. You're brand new. You just got, just got planted. You come over this side, please. You're 20 years old now. Things are growing. Come over here, please. You're 40. You're getting up there. You come over. <laughs> You're 60. Now I need a couple more. Oh, you're someone who's 80. Now I need someone who's 100. All right, why have I done this? <laughs> Hold that up. Hold that up so everyone can see. Oh, thank you very much for volunteering. Now this is your well-managed, even-aged forest. The new plantations, some are 20 years, some are 40, some are 60, some are 80, and some are 100 years old. This is what, as a planner in forest, we would like to see. So as we cut off the 100-year-old trees at the end of the rotation, the 80 becomes 100, the 60 becomes 80, the 40 becomes 60, and the 20 becomes 40. You get up to 20, it becomes to zero. Perfectly good example of sustained yield management lasts as long as we live. Now, something really bad happens. We lose a whole bunch of the 80-year-old wood. Some gets burned up, some gets taken away, some gets preserved for parks. Um, um, but there's a little bit left. Now, we finish cutting the 100-year-old forest. You may sit down, please. What are we going to cut now? The 60 has only grown to 80. We have this big gap in the material that's available to harvest, and we have to try and make it up. We make it up by reducing the harvest. Can. We make it up by going elsewhere. The companies holler to be able to go into preserved areas because we need some more wood. Uh, communities begin to fall apart because sawmills have to close. The end result, of course, is a, an overall layer laying down of the whole allowable cut. So that is the effect that these policy changes have and, of course, natural changes like the huge fires we've had recently. Okay, thank you very much. They did a good job, didn't they? Okay, so about 20% of the logging rights of the licenses were taken back and reallocated to competitive, competitive auction sales. In 2002, the Forest and Range Practices Act enshrined the planning, road building, logging, reforestation, and grazing together. And here the government sets objectives for biodiversity, cultural heritage, all the other values we associate with the forest, fish, recreation, land, soil, timber, visual quality, water, wildlife. Now before logging can take place, a stewardship plan must be completed and presented to the public for review and comment. Additional operation plans must be prepared for the government and made available. So now we've reached 2018. So what's going on today? Let's remember, we're now talking about one half of the provincial forest land that is the working forest. We've shrunk forestry to a much smaller portion of the land base. Well, long before there is a road built or a tree cut, there's a huge amount of activity. Working together, registered professional foresters, engineers, landscape architects, archaeologists, Biologists and others will plan a harvest based on sustainable management principles and consultation with the public and First Nations. As plans progress and permits are issued, professional foresters will be actively involved as harvesting begins. Road building and cutting is monitored. Post-harvest treatments are effected. Planting or natural regeneration will take place. And the new forest will be tended as needed until the new crop is well established and free to grow. 
It's worthwhile to broaden our forest vision from what we see around our local area to the province. You can read those figures as I talk. I will do my best to avoid statistics and comparisons that are difficult to comprehend. We used to say every year we cut enough lumber to build a wooden highway around the world ten times. Well, so what does that mean? That's pretty hard to visualize, isn't it? So I'm going to try and give you some figures that will help you understand just what the forestry is in this province. You've probably, most of you, visited an IKEA store, been in the one in Vancouver or somewhere else. The sawmill that you pass going to Kelowna, Gorman Brothers Sawmill there, is pretty average in its production. It produces a very different kind of a quality material, but it's about the average production per year at most sawmills in British Columbia. In one single eight-hour shift, that mill will cut enough of wood to supply the bank of or IKEA store for a full year. The average BC sawmill will consume, every day that it's operating, about 80 truckloads of logs. It will cut enough lumber in one day to build about 60 houses. And if you're interested in how much wood one of those big logging trucks that you see running through town carries, it will take about one and a third of those to provide enough lumber to build one house. Or the lumber trucks that you see going by with what look like bricks of lumber, which we call a lift of lumber, it will take six of those to build one house. Now if we move to the biggest sawmill in the province, and probably one of the most efficient, it will consume every day that it's operating about 200 truckloads of logs and enough material to build 150 houses. Moving on in our province, we've got, uh, uh, where is it leading, I would say? Well, technology is a pretty good indicator. You see from this slide, uh, the tallest building so far, the 18 stories wooden building on the University of British Columbia, is energy efficient enough that it's equivalent to removing 511 cars off the road every year in terms of reducing pollution, enough to power 222 homes. And right now, British Columbia is the largest bioenergy producer in North America. We have a huge number of wood products other than lumber. And I brought some samples for you to examine there, finger jointing to make boards, various types of fiber, chip boards, laminated boards, and new technologies for these products are developing every day. But we came here to talk about the forest, so what about it? If you're fortunate enough to be able to visit an active logging operation, you might be amazed to see there'll be nobody on the ground. Humans will be driving the machines that cut down the trees, cut off the branches, stack the logs. Other machines will load the trucks. And every machine will tread the ground carefully. Sensitive areas will be avoided or treated prescriptively. Wildlife values will be respected. Riparian limits will be off limits. Machine operators are assisted with digital technology to accurately measure tree diameters, height, and robotically cut the log lines. GPS systems will track and guide every movement. The trucks have built-in scales to measure their weight, to conform to the transportation regulations, on-the-go tire inflation, to change in fire, tire inflation to accommodate changing road conditions. And of course, all the operators will be in constant touch by radio and GPS to ensure efficiency, and more importantly, safety in the woods. In the future, you can expect to see driver of technology begin to invade the forest. How would you feel if you leave this uh, group today and you meet one of those great monster logging, logging trucks and you look into the cab and there's no driver? Remember the expression, they can't see the forest because of the trees? Well, that has changed. And what we are seeing now is the forest and all that it contains beside the trees. We are witnessing a growing emphasis on the environment and the public desires. We use drones to assist in evaluating plantations, fire activity, and remediation. We have a recent technology called LIDAR that from the air can image right through the forest to the ground. Before venturing into the forest, roads can be planned on a preliminary basis, individual trees measured for height, 
and very soon diameter. Hillsides can be assessed for stability, land evaluated for recreation, grazing, and other characteristics. But of course, none of this eliminates the need for boots in the forest. Before concluding, I want to return to the landlord-tenant situation. Remember that right from the beginning, in 1865, the forests belonged to the public. And the best analogy is one we are most familiar with, housing. The landlord tries to choose a tenant that will best look after the house. The good tenant will treat the house the way the rental contract requires. Obviously, the tenant does not expect to be required to fix a leaky roof, remodel a kitchen, or paint the walls. For a tenant, the longer the lease, the more small improvements he or she will likely make at his or her own expense. It's the same in the forest, with one exception for an area that's called a tree farm license. There's no guarantee that the company that plants the trees will be the company that harvests the crop. Hence, the company does exactly what the landlord wants and no more. No chance to plant genetically improved trees, enhance weeding, no chance for forest silvicultural activities like pruning, thinning. No chance for enhanced road maintenance or upgrading of recreational facilities. Now, of course, the landlord could demand the tenant do these things, but that would require the landlord to reduce the rent, and our governments have ruled that out. Often people point to forests in Germany, Austria, and Scandinavia as examples that we might follow, very intensive management. In these countries, for several centuries, approximately half of the forest land is privately owned. And there is, of course, legislation requiring certain standards on your own land. But if the private landowner invents an improvement that makes sense, other owners will adopt it. And if it really makes sense, then most likely the landlord will adopt it too. And the better result is better forestry. I expect most of you have driven the Coquihalla Highway or flown recently from Penticton to Vancouver and witnessed the extent of forest harvesting. How many have seen all those big clear cuts up at the top? Just some, of the, some would say rampant clear cutting devastating the landscape. Not so. What you see is a well-managed working forest part of the 50% of the provincial forest land dedicated to sustainable management. Today, we are about 40 years into management on an 80-year rotation. You are seeing about 50% of that forest already harvested. Now, I'm going to say something that will probably spark some serious discussion. That is exactly where good management says it should be. From the forest management, we are right on target. Now, I'm convinced our forests will continue to grow and thrive. Dick Cannings, our local MP, has just introduced a private member's bill that seeks to further the use of wood on Canadian government buildings. I see the future at my alma mater, UBC. The forestry dean there, John Innes, was last month elected an international fellow of the prestigious Royal Swedish Academy. In 2017 at UBC, there were 1,011 students registered in forestry. 351 of these were majoring in natural resource conservation. 293 in professional forestry, 155 in wood products manufacturing and research, and 99 in urban forestry. 47% of these students are female. Wouldn't you say the future forests are in good hands? Thank you.
levanta el peso como puede ser que el humano no respeta la vida la vida lo que nos sostiene honra la tierra versa al cielo ama a tus hermanos levanta el peso
close to my heart. I grew up at a farm 40 kilometers south of Gothenburg. When I was little, I played in the forest. I climbed the trees and built tree houses. And when I got older, I started to work and hunt in the woods, which meant I got to see many different types of forests. Oak forests, beautiful ones, birch forests, mixed forests and plantations. I realized that the forest could change rapidly, literally from one step to another. On the one side you can have a vibrant mixed forest and on the other you can have a dark monoculture with no undergrowth at all. I was 16 when I started to work in the forest together with my grandfather. He was taught forestry during the 50s and 60s when clear cuts and spruce plantation was the tune of the time. Leaf tree was at the time seen as a weed that was sprayed away with poison or cleaned away by hand. So, one day at the coffee table, I asked him if forestry couldn't be done in another way. Do we have to cut down the forest and turn it into a plantation? Yes, he said, bumping his fist to the table. Clear cuts and plantation is the only rational and thereby profitable way of forestry. And that you must understand. Well, what do you reply to something like that when you're 16? At the time I didn't reply at all, but the question never left me. Forestry forms the forests all over the globe. Roughly one third of all the land is covered with trees. But what is a forest? What does something have to contain to be called a forest? Trees, of course, but uh, animals, some other plants, certain level of biodiversity. Is this a forest? Or is this forestry? I would call them a plantation and a clear cut, not a forest or forestry. I was sitting at a cafe in Visby, together with a manager of one of the biggest forestry companies in Sweden. It was a good atmosphere and a warm tune in our conversation. We were talking about the forestry and forest development history, and he told me that the first really big clear cut, they were made by hand here in Sweden, and skidded by horses before the big machines entered the forestry. And then we talked about the different forestry methods have been used over the years, and that we now here in Sweden, for 50 years, have based our forestry upon clear cutting and plantation of conifer trees like spruce and pine. And then he looked at me with a peaceful belief and said, one ought to be careful with a method that works. I still wonder what he meant with words. For me, forestry embraced far more than the growing of timber. For me, forestry encapsulates biodiversity, humans and animals. For me, isn't this a forest? It's a plantation with a negligibly number of ecosystem services. A forest is a living organism that has evolved over millions of years with hundreds of thousands of species turned out to a unique composition that is special for each site and condition, like this. My question when I was 16 was if forestry couldn't be done in another way. In the 80s there was another man asked himself the same question. It was in Germany after they had got several large storm damages, large enough to affect the economy in their forestry. 
So, we continue the thinking and realize that trees is actually growing almost everywhere in our part of the world. We actually constantly have to do things if we don't want trees to grow. Abandoned grazing lands are turning into forests. Ditches along the roads has to be cleaned, otherwise they will by time be full of trees. So the question was not if trees can grow by themselves. The question was, is it possible to form a profitable forestry upon the principle of nature? And um, to understand what turned out to be called close to nature forestry, we start to have a look at the opposite, the plantation forestry of today. Then the idea is that you each year cut an area with big trees, like I showed before, or a bit bigger. And then you plant new ones. And then the idea is that you manage them in such a way, by cleaning and thinning, that they all will be ready to be cut again at the same time. And then you repeat the system. One creates monocultures, plantations, with very little room for nature, and thereby for ecosystem services. In close to nature forestry, the idea is that you want to mix vibrant, vital forests all over. Big trees, small trees standing side by side. How the forest will look depends on where we are in the world, the soil condition, water, everything. And then you carefully harvest and thin among the biggest trees in such a way that the natural ecosystem can maintain and develop at the same time we harvest some trees. Today, is ecology and production two separate questions? Actually, it's two separate areas. The NGOs is fighting for more nature and the industry for more production. My vision is a forestry where nature and production walk hand in hand. Actually, where a vital ecosystem will be the natural foundation for all production. One day I was standing in the forest in Lübeck with the manager, Mr. Storm. We were talking about biotope trees and nature conservation. And I asked him how many biotope trees they save on each hectare for, for nature. And then he said, no, the number of biotope trees is not an important question. What did I say? To set aside a certain number of biotope trees is a very important question. No, he said. The constant presence <coughs> of big, full-grown trees with thick bark and dead branches. That's the important part, not what you call them. Then I understood something. It's not about a number. It's about a principle. The principle of minimum interference. To base the forestry on the principle of nature and do it in such a way that the natural ecosystem can maintain and develop at the same time we harvest some trees. Fifty years ago, clear cuts and spruce plantation was in one way irrational. The industry at the time could only make use of spruce and pine. Ecosystem services was not the question, neither was bioenergy. Today it's different. The industry can make use of many tree species. Ecosystem services is a big question, and bioenergy is rising. Now after 20 years, by using this principle in Lübeck, the result is even better than the prognosis. The income is good, biodiversity is rising, people around it loves it, and even the NGOs gives it their support for its ability to combine nature and production. I have a dream of a living forest all around to show people what is possible, to inspire and thereby step by step change the forestry. Nature is working 24-7. The only thing we have to do is to watch and learn and to take out a new direction that allows nature to appear everywhere. And ecosystem services, it's far more than a modern name. It's beautiful, it's great, and it's a foundation for human life on Earth.